Gracious Lord, thank you that you're promised that when we gather together today, here, in the name of your Son, that you are here in our midst. So we thank you, O Lord, that not only can we be here with each other, but we also thank you that you are here. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence. Work in us that which you desire. Draw us close to you. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> this is my first time to be, Co be at Coventry, so I'm, I'm really pleased, excited to be here. Um, I'm just actually getting to know James and Mary, uh, and we had dinner last night, actually, down in Ocala, and um, spent the night, and then came here this morning. We're actually celebrating two things, and I think they go together. One, of course, is that we're celebrating the institution of the new vicar of Coventry Church, James Giles, his wife Mary, their family, and you're welcoming them into this community. The second thing that we're celebrating is the Feast of the Epiphany, the coming of the wise men to visit Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Now, I think there's something important about the fact that we're doing the two of these things together. So what I want to do very briefly is talk a little bit about Epiphany and how that might apply to this celebration of new ministry, the institution of your new vicar. First of all, as it relates to Epiphany, it's hard for us to imagine in a completely internet-connected world where Larley and I can, for example, go on Skype and talk to our son who lives in Durham, England, and see his face and he see ours, where we can get literally a Twitter feed from any place on the planet where we know instantaneously about almost any event on the world. If we want to find it, we can look it up and, make sure, and hear about it just almost in real time. That kind of interconnectedness on this has never happened before. No other generation has ever known that kind of interconnected global piece of communication. So you ha it's a stretch for us, because this is not the world we live in now. That if you go back to the time of the coming of the wise men, none of that existed at all. And it was never more importantly felt than around the question of religion. Because each ethnic group had its own religion. And it was sort of, they were like regional gods. So we have our gods because we're Persians. You have your gods because you're Israelites. And the Egyptians have their gods because they're Egyptians. And, you know, and it's almost like there's a deity assigned to each ethnic group, each country. So when the words were spoken that we read today, for example, from the prophet Isaiah, that gifts would come from Arabia and Saba to a deity event that happened in Israel, that was shocking information. They did not know how to put that together. And yet, the Old Testament, in the lessons that we've read and in others, was very clear that this was going to be an international event, not merely a Jewish event. And so what happens, of course, is this entirely supernatural string of events occur. You have these Persians who are court officials and probably astrologers by profession advisors to the, to the people in charge, to the king, there in, in Persia. They see, in watching the constellation of the stars, a star that they've literally never seen before. And they think, as they would in that day, they wouldn't see it as a scientific event. They would say, this is an omen. This must mean something. Something important is happening. And the star is the sign. And so they search their own religious documents and others and finally figure out that this star is a sign that someone of incredible importance is going to be born. And they, they determine and they pack up. And you have to imagine, it's like an entourage. 
Don't think merely of the, your nativity scene or mine, where you have sort of three kings and a camel or two. Uh, there are probably 40 to 50 people in this entourage. Servants, drivers, people who carried, you know, who carried mules that had all the packing on them. I mean, these were wealthy court officials who always traveled in an entourage entourage, and probably some kind of armed guard, because where they were going from what we would now know as Iran, all the way down into Bethlehem in that area, was a long journey and there were lots of robbers. So imagine an extraordinary parade of people with lots of we obvious wealth. We would think if it happened in our day, we would think it would be a motorcade of Police on armed police with motorcycles, and then a fleet of limousines making their way. All I mean, that would be the, the modern equivalent of something like that if they were on the road as opposed to in the air. And so they made their way, and so clearly they caused a stir. I mean, can you imagine this entourage coming into what's really a pretty small little village at the time, Jerusalem? You know, people didn't travel like that. I mean, we might talk about getting on a plane and going to visit our friends in San Francisco, for example, or flying down to Mexico. None of that ever happened. So that the fact that this journey happened, this extraordinary journey, was huge news. No wonder it got the attention of Herod, the local king. Who, who are these Persians? I mean, are they planning to come and scout out the land? Are they sending an army to come and take over Israel? That would have been their first thought, you see. And so there's this conversation that we read about. We've come to find out, you know, who is this one, this king of the Jews that's been born? Because see, obviously the stars, they think, led them there. And you know, you know the details of the story. The point of the story is, is that when this extraordinary entourage ends up in Bethlehem, I mean, can you imagine? Imagine what would in the, be the equivalent in our country of a mobile home and a police motorcade, and a fleet of limos pulling up in front of this mobile home. And the Secret Service guards come and knock on the door, even as the drivers are opening the limousine doors to let out these officials in their $5,000 suits and their $400 men's shoes. I mean, that's what we're thinking. They've come there to give this couple. Remember, he's a blue, Joseph's a blue-collar carpenter. And to bring them gifts that in any economy are worth an extraordinary amount of money. Great wealth, actually, are given to them. All of which is meant to say that the baby in a manger really is God's chosen one worth far more than any gift that could be given to him. And the big news, this is what Paul highlights in the Ephesian lesson that she read, is that this was not just some local deity. That unlike the entire assumption that this group had their gods, this group had their gods, this group had their gods, this one is to be the savior of the world. Paul's language is Jew and Gentile. And Gentile, if you were a Jew, was shorthand for everybody who wasn't like us, ethnically. Asian, African, Latino, Anglo. See, everybody, anybody, Native American. And so what Paul is saying is, is that, and, and it's, it's thunder-striking, extraordinary, shocking news to hear that. That Jesus is, in fact, what you and I know, is the savior of the world. Not any particular ethnic group at all, but that no matter who you are, regardless of race, regardless of education, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of what you have or have not done in your life, regardless of the sins that you've committed, the wickedness that you've done, the places that you're totally ashamed to tell anybody that you have ever done, all people, regardless of who they are, can come and bend the knee and know an intimate and personal relationship with Jesus Christ in a way that is life transforming. That's the secret, the mystery hidden from the ages to which Paul refers. 
And then, which is no wonder why he talks about in the epistle the unfathomable riches of Christ. In other words, there's enough there for any, everybody, no matter who you are. You can never dig down to the bottom of God's supply. There's always more. He cares for you intimately, and it's, the care is big enough for everybody. So it's not like you've got this tiny little table with a little bit of food on it, and we say, okay, there are four of us. That means you get this much, you get this much, you get this much. Just the opposite. Literally, no matter how many people show up, there's always going to be room. It's the feeding of the 5,000, only we're talking about what God can do in the human heart. That's epiphany. That the boundless riches of Christ are available to absolutely everyone, no matter who they are, where they've been, or what they've done. All can come and know the great joy, the boundless riches of Christ. That's extraordinary news. And that's what we're celebrating in the Feast of the Epiphany. We're not just talking about three wise men showing up at a stable. We're talking about a seismic shift in the world's understanding of religion. We're talking about the fact there is one Messiah, his name is Jesus, and he is available for everyone, no matter who you are. Now, here's the question I'm running, rolling around in my mind. What does this have to do with the institution of James Jones? <laughs> and this occasion here at Coventry. Well, I have a sense, I have a profound belief that there are very, very few coincidences in life. That I think God has put this together. Because it seems to me, remember there's this tagline at the end of the Ephesian lesson, where Paul says that through the church, now who's the church? That's us, believers in Jesus. The many-sided wisdom of God. Can, is revealed even to principalities and powers. In other words, we as a church, a body of people, are called to be an expression, a visible expression of everything that the scripture says and teaches. So that says to me, James, that a part of God's call on Coventry Church is to be a place where regardless of race, socioeconomic status, where you've been, what you've done, education, rich or poor, young or old, regardless of your age, what you've done, this is a place where you can come to know and experience the very riches of Christ. I don't know about you, but I go to some churches in my diocese. Everybody looks exactly the same. You might as well be at a club. <laughs> They have a lot in common socially. They all know the same people. They all go to the same places. They eat the same kind of food. And they really like each other's company. But I have to tell you, I'm not sure that's a witness of the gospel, of the many-sided wisdom of God to the world. Perhaps Coventry can be a place where regardless of who you are, where you've come from, what you've been, what used to happen in your life, this is a place where you can discover the life-changing power of Jesus in your life because he really is the savior of the whole world, not just people that we may like. Now, that's not easy. It's much easier to build a club where you have a lot in common, where you know what to talk about when you sit, sit down over a meal because your kids are in the same schools or you shop at the same stores or you may think politically in the same way or, you know, those kinds of things. It's much harder, harder <laughs> to build a community of people who are learning to love each other and to live out this gospel when socially, economically, in other ways, we may not have a lot in common. That's harder. But I think that's the task of what it means to be the church. So, James, my brother in Christ, my vicar to this parish as bishop, my hope for you and for this church is that Coventry, with an echo of a church that arose out of the ashes of the destroyed cathedral 
in England, I've been there, can be a place where a new beginning happens here, where this becomes a church that's known in Marion County, in the community. That I know there are a lot of churches you can go to, but if you really want to go to a family of people that actually love each other, they really care about you no matter who you are, and are trying to find ways to serve other people because that's our call to reach out, then this is the place for you. You see, there are lots of churches. You actually may or may not be called to come to Coventry. I hope you are. But are you willing to be a part of that vision? And to support James, Mary, his family, as they undertake what is in fact not an easy task. I believe that could be, you have to really discern, but I think that could be God's call on this church. To be that kind of family of people. If so, then in many ways this will be not just epiphany as something that happened 2,000 years ago, but an epiphany as in, which means an awakening. An awakening for people who come in and say, wow, this is different from some of the churches I've known before. Maybe this is where I can belong. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this body of people. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would knit them together, both with each other, with James, Mary, all of those in their household, that this would be a family of people who love one another, who, who care for one another, even sacrificially, and who are become known in this community as a place where, regardless of who you are, where you've been, what you've done, that people can come here and know the amazing riches of Christ. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.